Hello. I'm back. I'm sorry I'm a couple of seconds late. I was sneezing. And so that's not good. That's not good teaching right there. So well, let's pray. Father, I ask you to bless our time together. I ask you to be with us as we study today. I ask that you um, bring us together through this medium and um, teach us together. And I ask you to bring in the people that you would have be with us today. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So I found my place in my study where we're going to start today. Um, and, um, hey, Tina's here. You're number one. You're number one. Yay, very cool. <clears throat> so we are in uh, Romans 8 20 right now verse 20 and um, this is one of the four verses F-O-R verses that we talked about last time and we're going to go back a little bit and catch up and so He says in verse 19, let's see, where is it? I'm scrolling back. So we talked, we talked uh, last time about how he uses the word F-O-R to, to uh, build, build one statement on another. So in uh, verse 18, he says this. Remember when I when I um, I was talking to someone this week, and um, about some articles I'd written, and and I said, you know, every single word that I write in those articles is specifically picked, because I'm trying to be led by the Holy Spirit of God, and I really believe the Holy Spirit of God has an excellent command of whatever language. So when he wrote this in the Greek to uh, the Romans, the, every single word is picked. To communicate a lot, right? So he, he tries to to get everything he can out of every single statement. So when he starts three or four verses with the word F O R, he's taking what was there before and he, he rolls it into this verse, and then he says he says such and such, and then he takes that and rolls it into the next verse. Starts with the word for, and you can almost put a therefore there. And so in this verse, in verse eighteen, let me. Let me go back. So, this is where that starts. In verse 16. Then he goes into 18. Hey, Michael Newman, it's good to see you here. So he says... The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children and heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together. Then he goes into verse 18, and he takes what he just said in 16 and 17. He rolls it into the idea of verse 18. Hey, Liz. And he says this. He says, For I consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So he takes the idea of suffering together with Christ so we may be glorified to him, and then he rolls it in to that next idea. And he does that again in verse 19. So in verse 19, he says this. Remember, we're in 20. But we're getting a running start on 20 right now. So in verse 19, he says this. He says, For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. So he takes verse uh, 15 and 16, or what was that, 16 and 17. Yeah. <clears throat> and he talks about this idea, and he narrows it down to us, 
Then he expands it and he says, this, this whole thing also includes all of the creation. So in verse 19 he said, For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. So he's talked about us being heirs and sons of God. So he narrows it down to us. Then he says, here's why us being revealed as heirs matters to the entire creation. And that's verse 19. <clears throat> and then we get to verse 20. Which says this. And we started, we, we finished last week in the midst of studying verse 20. He says, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. And so that's where we are right now on the eighth day. And that last clause, at least when I was studying, Hey, Michael, happy anniversary. What a great way to celebrate your anniversary I, i'm not going to put that burden on everybody else but if that's what you want to do in your anniversary we're happy for um michael and karen how many years michael how many years have y'all been married now so while he's telling us that um, so when I when I was studying this, it just seems like that last clause, not willingly but because of him who subjected in hope, seems a little bit bulky. So I did some research. Now as an aside, as an aside, there are many Bible ver passages which can be confusing. And mostly, I believe, well, happy first anniversary. Very cool. You know, y'all look so comfortable together that you look like you could have been married for years when we, when we met you that time. So many Bible verses can be confusing. Mostly, I believe, the confusion stems from the fact that they were originally written in either Hebrew and Greek, usually, <clears throat> and a smattering of other languages. And we don't speak or read any of those. So... It's the translations from Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic and, and uh, Chaldean, things like that, um, that tend to cause the problems that we experience in understanding. In this case, the commentaries, when I looked at the commentaries, they didn't ease my concern much, but they did help me understand a little better, so I'm going to pass that on. What did help was looking at various translations and seeing those in the context of its connection to verses 19 and 21 since both verses 19 and 21 are one uh, 19 and 20 are one sentence so let's look at that together we're going to look at it in the complete Jewish Bible then the New American Standard and then finally in the American and then in the easy to read version so let's look at those in the context of how the verses fall and then see if it makes more sense. So in a complete Jewish Bible, it says this. So it's going to roll a lot easier than just seeing it one verse at a time. The creation waits eagerly for the sons of God to be revealed, for the creation was made subject to frustration, not willingly, but because of the one who subjected it. But it was given a reliable hope that it too would be set free from its bondage to decay and would enjoy the freedom accompanying the glory that God's children will have. And that makes more sense, doesn't it? When you look at it in the context of um, 19 through 21, in the way that you... That Paul wrote the letter and so we have to remember that you know often in Christianity we we proof text by it will say something and we'll use one verse completely out of context to make our point and it's in the context of the topic but not in the context of how it falls out in a letter we that's why it's important to just pick up like 
Philemon or James, and when you read it all the way through sometimes, and this is 16 chapters, so, so it takes a little longer to do that, but to read Romans all the way through flows better than if you take one verse by itself. So that was the complete Jewish Bible. Let's look at the New American Standard Bible. And this is the Bible that, that I first got when I was first born again. I actually still have that Bible right here on my desk. Um, it, and the same verse in the New American Standard reads like this, the same passage. The anxious longing of the creation awaits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Now, so far, I think that the uh, complete Jewish Bible is, is makes most sense. Well, let's look at the easy-to-read version of the Bible. The ERV, it's called. Everything that God made is waiting with excitement for the time he will show the world who his children are. The whole world wants very much for that to happen. Everything God made was allowed to become like something that cannot fulfill its purpose. That was not its choice, but God made it happen with this hope in view, that the creation would be made free from ruin, that everything God made would have the same freedom and glory that belonged to God's children. In other words, that everything would come back to God's original intent for it. He's restoring everything that was lost in the fall of man. And then understanding this makes something Jesus said in the Gospel of John make more sense to us. And that's out of John 12, 44 to 47. And Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me sees him who sent me. I have come as, as a light into the world, that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe it, do not judge him. For I did not come in the world to judge it, but to save the world. So he's not here to judge the cosmos. The, the systems that Satan put in place on the earth. He came to redeem them, to save all those systems and bring them back to God's original order. If you look around us, if you have eyes to see it, you'll see Satan's hand polluting, twisting, perverting everything. Even, even Jesus' church has been messed with and so everything, and nothing, nothing as far as he is concerned, as far as the devil is concerned, is outside of, is exempt from his touch. He wants to mess everything up. So he does it with health, he does it with sexuality, he does it with perceived gender, he does it with um, uh, standards, he does it with everything, right? So we have to be aware of that. The term save the world <clears throat> literally means there in Roman and John 12:47 literally means to deliver or redeem the world the cosmos back into God's uh, orderly arrangement when God created everything it was in perfect order when Adam turned it over to Satan the destroyer the cosmos God's order was was plunged into chaos and disorder as God's kingdom spreads in Christ through us, the sons of God, his order is put back in place and things start to fall into place. And, and then you can see that order. One of the things that my pastor is in heaven now, Don Gunner, would do is he would, he would bring that order to all kinds of simplistic things, things that you know seemingly didn't look like they made a lot of difference. Um, for instance, he would, he would like if someone left a, a basket out in a parking lot at a store, 
blocking the aisle. Hey, Dana and Kevin, it's good to see you and glad you're here. If he saw a, a basket that wasn't in place, he would push it in and put it in a basket corral. He, he would do that because he recognized that Satan's chaos and disorder filters all the way down to, to, to people um, putting like boxes of food in the wrong place on, on shelves and all kinds of stuff. And so I learned that from him. To, to practice God's order in seemingly insignificant things. So one day I was in a local store in the next town, a place called Brookshire's, that we do most of our food shopping in. And someone had, I guess it was a box of cereal or some kind of stuffing or something. Hi, hi John. It is never an interruption to tell me that you're here. I love it when people tell me in the study, Joy, because Facebook doesn't allow us to see the joins. And so I never really know who's here unless you greet us. So thank you. Um, so anyway, it was either a box of stuffing or it was something in a box like cereal. And it was laying face down on the floor. And I just walked over to it, picked it up, and put it where it belonged. And because of that, a lady walked up to me and said, can you help me find whatever the food was? Because she thought, that if I was putting something back where it belonged, I was only doing it because someone paid me to do it. She thought I was an employee of Brookshire's. So I smiled at her and I said, well, I'll do my best. I don't know where everything is, but I'll try. And so I help her find a can of beans or whatever it is she's looking for. And then she says, thank you. How long have you worked here? I've never seen you here before. And I said, I don't. I'm shopping. That's my cart right over there. And she goes, well, why did you put that back up? And I said, because it wasn't where it belonged. And I think that's, that's what am I doing? I never, I never said, hi, I'm super Christian. I'm putting, I didn't do any of that stuff. What I did was just practice God's order in what seemed to be a relatively, a rather uh, insignificant way. And I believe that we can do that. My neighbor does this all the time. He's an older man, older than me. And um, if the garbage man comes and empties our can, it'll usually be out in the street when he does it, you know, like about three feet from the curb. And he'll roll it back and put it where it belongs. It takes several extra steps, but when he walks away, he knows something is where it belongs. And I just think we could make a difference doing relatively simple things like that. Just putting things in order. One day I was out uh, clipping limbs on a tree and someone from the city asked me why I was doing it. I said, because you can't see oncoming traffic. And, and he went, oh, he never thought about it. And what did it take? It, take? it took like eight minutes of my time to put that clipper in the vehicle, bring it over there and do that. I just think we can do stuff like that. And it's not a huge thing. We don't have to crow about it. I don't. I hope I'm not coming off as bragging about it. I just think I'm giving an example of, of something. Uh, of the sons of God bringing order to the cosmos, to saving the world, if you will, redeeming something that's out of order for putting something into order. It was in perfect order. And now through us, the sons of God, who are being revealed often by bringing order where there is none. So you don't have to make a big deal. You don't have to wear a humongous cross around your neck. You don't have to lug around the biggest Bible you have that's really designed to hold your uh, coffee table down or press flowers or something. It's, it's, uh, you don't have to make a big deal or wear you know, a Christian uniform of any kind. You can just bring order and it'll stand out. You can do it people ask you to do and do it completely and do it without grumbling. You can uh, not take the bait in an argument. Uh, there's so many ways to practice this. Just as light dispels darkness, God's order dispels chaos and disorder which come from the enemy. In fact, the word, the term kingdom of God literally refers to God's kingdom rule, his reign, his action, 
his lordship, his sovereign governing, his order. And this means that as the kingdom of God flourishes in the heart of one believer, just one believer, and each of us is one believer, as God's kingdom flourishes in the heart of one believer, as, as his reign, as his order, as his lordship flourishes in one human being that's born again, God's order becomes more apparent in that person and then through that person into this chaotic world in which God chooses to allow us to live. This is what Romans 8.19 talks about when it says, this is the revealing of the sons of God. So you don't have to go to seminary to do this. You don't have to know every scripture by heart. You don't need to be able to speak Greek and Hebrew. And all those things are great. They're fine. You know, it's, but you don't have to do it. Everybody can do this on the job, wherever. I, every time, like today, I called somebody. Uh, I was trying to help somebody else out. So I was talking to this lady, and I don't know where she was. Um, she, had, she had like a Hispanic accent, and she was working at a service desk someplace. And when we were done, I said, well, God bless you. <clears throat> and she stammered. And she said, uh, thanks. And because I don't know if she's like allowed to say, God bless you, but my boss is Jesus, so he lets me do that. And so I can say, God bless you, whenever I want. And you don't even have to sneeze first, right? So, so um, just saying something like that. So let's just tell you a quick little story. Uh, about I guess it's about eight years ago, maybe ten. Laura and I went. We were invited to go to a, a a country in Africa on the Atlantic coast, Equatorial Africa. It's called Sierra Leone. If you've ever seen the movie Blood Diamonds, it takes place in that nation. If you ever heard of the Ebola virus, that broke out about six months after we left Sierra Leone. And um, so that's where we went. We taught the entire leadership of a denomination um, that's Bible-based about the Holy Spirit because their denomination tends to minimize uh, God, the Holy Spirit. And so we went there to teach. And then we spent, like, uh, we, we traveled through Paris, and then on our way back we spent two nights in Paris because it was around this time of year, and it was almost our anniversary. So we did that. And... Um, so I, I, I got on AT&T and called AT&T and talked to a service person. And I said I wanted to see if there was, a, you can get a foreign plan for a month, pay extra for a month, but not be charged with um, out-of-country phone calls, which are pretty exorbitant prices. And you can do text messages. So I did that. So the lady said, can I ask you what you're doing there? Now, she was a, a, a son of God. She was a child of God. And, she, and I said, well, I'm actually going there. I'm a minister. I'm going to teach, teach this. And she said, um, well, that's interesting. She goes, um, can I send you my personal email? And I said, sure, why? She says, I want to be on your prayer team to pray for your trip. And I thought that was cool. Like, she couldn't give me her AT&T you know, work email, but she could do that. So she did my work for me. She set it all up, and, and then when I came back, I canceled that, that plan because I didn't need it anymore. I wasn't in Africa or, or Paris anymore. But um, it was so cool to see her operating in her inheritance as a believer. And so I sent her, in like, prayer requests throughout the whole thing when we had a car breakdown, when we had... Um, looked like things, schedules weren't working out and all that sort of thing. And when we were traveling out to the bush and when we were traveling back, and so when we when we could, I did that. So it was pretty cool. Uh, my point is that there's lots of ways that the revealing of the sons of God can occur and we can participate in that. <clears throat> so let's get back to Romans chapter 8. Uh, and now we're going to go to verse 21. And I'm going to do 20 and 21 together and 
remember if you came in say hello so we'll know you're here it's not an interruption for the creation was subjected to futility not willingly but because of him or on behalf of him who subjected it in hope because the creation itself will also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Now one thing to think about whenever we hear the word delivered, and we're not just talking about deliverance from demons, just deliverance or rescue from anything that's anywhere near connected. Every, there's so much connected to the fall of man. So one thing to think about with the idea of being delivered is that deliverance is also is always intentional that word means the word deliverance means to set free or to set at liberty and this is an intentional thing it never happens by accident or as a happy side effect when God sets out to free something he has the intention to do it and he's gonna do it right and this is important for us to receive if we ever had an intention to be great, grateful to God for what he has done, not just for people, but for all creation. And what exactly has he done in this regard? In other words, from what? So, so if you talk deliverance, you have to think about from what God is delivering us from. So if you go, um, I want to, I'm, I'm going to go practice deliverance on Saturday. <coughs> what is it? Is it deliverance from a demon? Is it deliverance from um, a compulsion or a, a um, an addiction? Is it deliverance from sin? Is it deliverance from lust? What is it? What is it? You know. So you have to consider the state of something prior to deliverance in order to fully realize the importance of the deliverance itself. Does that make sense? The reason I say this is that we, we hear these words and we don't really consider the magnitude of what it means. From what has God delivered the creation? And Paul tells us this in this verse. In, in verse 21, he says, The creation itself will also be delivered from the bondage of corruption. So we're going to look at what that means. When man fell, creation fell with him. Because man had authority over creation that God gave him, he squandered that. He didn't treat it with the gravity that it needed. And because of that, creation fell when the keeper of creation fell, when mankind fell. And so um, Jesus delivers us from the bondage of corruption and... Creation will be delivered as well. Now, the word bondage simply means slavery, and we know we know what that means. Paul pointed out that we were slaves of sin in Romans 6. And back when we were, we almost never realized that we were slaves of sin. And that's because Satan is a liar, and he had convinced us that our rebellion was freedom, right? Isn't that how we behave when we're rebellious? As we think, hey, we're free. We don't have to be bound up by any rules or commandments or anything like that. Um, we, we don't even think about that, right? And so we think our bondage to sin is freedom. Isn't that curious that that's the truth? Um, we almost never realize it because Satan is a liar. He convinces us that our rebellion is freedom. We were slaves, deluded into thinking we were free men. And this is something to remember when we consider a lost person that's in our realm of influence. When we start talking about slavery to sin, they don't know what the heck we're talking about unless they're actively addicted to something. If they're actively addicted to something and they hate it, they're aware that they're not free. But otherwise, if they're working and having their life and living or like living the way all most people live, they really don't know that they're slaves of sin. And so we have to be sensitive to how we address this 
because what we're really doing is awakening a person's awareness to a need that they so blatantly need from our viewpoint but is obscured to them so we have to be sensitive to that otherwise they're just going to blow us off and they're going to shut down and they won't receive that from anyone all and really i just i just want to pause for a second there there's no reason for us to be tenuous and shy and timid and afraid that we're going to make a mistake because we will we're going to make mistakes but let's try if shall we to to the best of our ability to listen to god as he leads us to each of these encounters because he knows what's going on inside that soul and we don't and he knows what's what's piquing their interest he knows what's convicting he knows what uh, where the resistance is he knows all this so let's follow his guidance and try to say what he tells us to say and do what he tells us to do and not say things that he's not telling us to do and not do things that he's not telling us to do so now all creation was enslaved to the bondage of corruption and that word corruption means destruction. It means ruin. It means decay. It means generally a fraying or wasting away. So when it says all creation was enslaved to the bondage of corruption, all creation was enslaved to decay, to destruction, to ruin, to a wasting away. That's a good point, Kevin. Give, give it to the Father in what, what he does with our attempt at spreading seeds. You know, sometimes you got to push a seed down in the earth and cover it up. Sometimes... You find that there's stuff growing that just fell off a tree. You know, I don't know if people are running around planting fallen acorns, but there's a whole bunch of oak trees around here that nobody planted. Uh, well, somebody did. God did. So you're right. Let God deal with the seeds that have been spread. That's his job. And he will send someone, like the scripture says, to, to water it and to uh, tend it and to you know, harvest it. That's his job. I mean, it's real, isn't it hard if you tried to be in ministry, like minister of reconciliation, as just everybody is, every Christian is, isn't it hard to practice catch and release? Because we love the people enough to reach out to them and risk their ire, you know, and blowing us off. Um, we care enough to do that. We, we really want a baby all that well it's not our job our job if he tells us to spread seeds is to spread seeds and our job is to like be a spiritual johnny apple seed just spreading seeds wherever we go wherever he says to spread them and so this is the reason because all creation was enslaved to the bondage of corruption this is why things age this is why things rust this is why there's disorder and this is why things fall apart. Things just fall apart. This weekend I went to go in my shed and the little screws that hold this metal door in, in the door frame fell out. I don't know how they fell out. I didn't unscrew them. Um, but I had to put bigger, longer screws in there to remount the door. How did that happen? Entropy. What is entropy? Entropy is part of the bondage of corruption. Things decay. Things fall apart. So in Romans 8.21, he says, Because the creation itself will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. In time, Paul says, the entire creation will be rescued from the disorder into which it was plunged when Adam disobeyed God. When that happens, the creation will find itself, according to the, the um, what the scripture says, in, 
in the glorious liberty of the children of God. It'll find itself in the liberty that we have. And the sad point is that I've made before is that many Christians don't even know that they're free. I've had people actually um, scoff at the idea that we're free because they've been exposed to man-made religion which takes away the freedom and reimposes law on the children of God and, um, and the born again. And, and so to them, Christianity is no, really no different than Old Testament legalism because that's the way it's practiced in their fellowship. Um, and so the whole, meanwhile, until that happens, until it's ushered into the freedom into the glorious liberty of the children of God, the whole creation still suffers. So that's why meteors fall into the earth. That's why we have sunspots. That way, that's why we have all the things that disrupt everyday life. That's why we have floods and earthquakes and tornadoes and hurricanes and all that stuff. That's the reason. So in the next couple of minutes, we're going to start on Romans um, 8.22. We're not going to finish it this week, but we're going to start it. <clears throat> Romans 8.22 is another verse that starts with 4. So, talking about what he just did, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected in hope, because the creation itself will also be delivered in the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So out of that comes this next verse that starts with the word F-O-R. For we know, now this is, he, he doesn't say we theorize, or we presume, or we assume, or we, we uh, figure, or we consider. He says we know, this is a fact, we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. I personally think things like hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, lightning strikes that blow trees up, and all those kind of things, um, tsunamis, these are what some of the birth pangs look like, where the whole creation groans and labors, you know, uh, together. The whole creation is going through something. It strikes me that the recipient of this letter, like you and me, probably never considered the whole creation in this way. And I point this out to make a point, and this is the point. Just who is the we in this verse if it's not Jesus and the readers of this letter? For we know, Paul's a reader of the letter too as he writes it. That's the secret about writing, is that the writer is the first reader of anything he writes. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. Just who is the we in this verse? I think it's the same persons addressed in this verse in Genesis 1, 26 that I'm about to paste. And God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. I believe the we is God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. And the scripture is clear that all scripture is, is breathed by God, by God the Holy Spirit. So as the Holy Spirit is talking through Paul, it's like he pulls back the curtain and he says, we're all very aware of this. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains 
together pangs and together until now. Listen to Hebrews 4.13 and this is where we'll end for tonight. And this comes out of the NIV because it communicates it better than the others, I think. He says this, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. God knows. God can see. God sees the earth crying out. Sometimes we forget the anguish our God experiences because he's all-knowing. He really does see everything. So we're going to stop here for this week. Uh, I think that was a kind of passionate teaching. Um, pray for me to catch up. I'm, I'm a little behind on my writing because we had we had a function a couple weeks ago and I couldn't write for half a week. And so I'm catching up. I'm trying to get 20 pages ahead. And I think I am three pages ahead. Not, not comfortable for me. So I'll be writing a lot this weekend. Um, we're going to pray, and then if, this, if anybody has any prayer requests, now's the time to say them. Um, uh, and then we can include them in the prayer. If I'm not seeing anything, so I'm just going to go pray. Father, I thank you so much that you're aware, that you know that all creation is crying um, out in pain, like birth pangs, and I know that you see our pain, and you know when we're anxious and when we're sad, when we're depressed, when we're afraid, when we're prideful, you know everything. You know, you see it all. And I thank you that you are truly all-knowing, uh, all-loving, all, -knowing, uh, all, loving, all um, places at one time and all-powerful. And that nothing in, in creation is hidden from your sight. Everything is laid bare up before you. And I ask you to remind us of that the next time we try to hide something from you. I ask you to bless us, Father. Bless all who view this, that have been a part of the study tonight, who take their time out to be a part of the study. I ask you to be with my friend Alan, who is, and his pastor, his pastor's mother, is about to pass and, and go to be with the Lord. And, um, and Alan, um, this is one of his spiritual moms. And when his mother died, this woman basically kind of adopted him and took him in as another son. And he's hurting, so I ask you to bless him and that, I ask you to bless um, some of the people that attend our home meetings that are uh, struggling with various decisions and, and changes and, and um, transitions from one job to another, from places to live. I ask you to be with our son in Oklahoma and his wife and daughters and their dogs as they find a new place to live um, because the landlord is selling the house. And, and so I ask you to bless um, bless all these. I ask you to be with us and bring us back together next time. I ask you to bless us in this Bible study that we're fixing to do on the radio. And I ask you to draw listeners to that. And I praise you for it. And I thank you for these things. Also, be with um, John and Anita. Anita's going to have surgery on um, Thursday. So I ask you to bless that surgery. And I thank you for that. So that uh, her leg will heal well. And I praise you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, if you um, um, want to watch these videos, you can always look at this website. I always paste these in the room. So you can look at that. Um, There's over 260 articles at this link. Um, one of the men I passed who took a job out of town. I sent him with like 20 articles. He's been reading through them. And one of the articles is what I'm going to teach on the radio tonight. And um, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I, I believe that these articles work better if we read them. And so um, I wrote them out of obedience to the Lord. I wrote them so I can learn something. But the Lord had me post it on the website so that other people can benefit, hopefully, to them also. And so it would benefit by them too. So I hope you can do that. Um, 
if you would like to call in tonight, um, I'm going to paste this from my earlier post. Um, if you uh, would like to be a part of this, you can do this. You can call in and you can... Um, or you can click on this link and that'll get you to the radio broadcast. It's streaming radio over the internet. And so I have to go to our world headquarter for uh, Truth Seeker Radio, TexasRadio.com, down the hall and get ready to teach. Thank you for being here tonight. I love you guys. I appreciate you being a part of the study. God bless you. I will see you next time, the Lord willing. Bye-bye.